Hey, booktube, long time no see. I'm going to do a short review of the small uh, of a book in the small amount of reading I've done in the last week. I don't know, time just gets away from you sometimes. This is uh, the book is called Alive by Lauren D. Esteban. It is a Valentino mystery. You can see that probably see that it relates to Bela Lugosi and the Frankenstein monster and like I said this is the third book in this series I think it's really the best one so far the first two are, are pretty good it's gotten better each book that I've read um, Valentino's this guy who's a, a film archivist at UCLA He's got a couple of friends that he works with a lot of time, like one of his students, a young woman who I think that's supposed to be her on the cover. Looks like a, like a, this kind of looks like a cyberpunk uh, cover. You know, maybe they're trying to cash in on the the girl with the dragon tattoo books or something when this came out. Um, he has. She's one of his sidekicks. His other sidekick is his mentor, his, his his film professor mentor, who hates basically every movie that's ever been made in color. Um, so they're they're very uh, steeped in Hollywood lore and stuff. And what happens in these books is he goes on some kind of quest to find a piece of missing footage of some movie. Ends up with a murder. I think this is really the best setup so far. He's Valentino's got this friend who's a washed up 80s action star like like sub like one level below if you can imagine one level below Steven Seagal or something who ends up uh, dead he believes because of this character being on the trail of a of a, of a great piece of film history that he wants to that, that he thinks he has a lead on that he's trying to sell and that piece of film history forms the backbone of the book which is uh, all these all these books relate to some sort of lost uh, you know by the end of the series there's going to be no lost legendary films anymore because like in one he finds the complete eight hour cut of, of greed and another one he finds other different lost things so this one is about a fabled piece of uh, a fabled screen test of Bela Lugosi as a Frankenstein monster in 1931 where he was originally after Frankenstein Bela Lugosi was going to be cast as the Frankenstein monster he kind of thought he would he would play the the doctor Dr. Frankenstein Victor Frankenstein the studio wanted him to play the monster because they I guess they thought that was the scarier part and they were thinking of him from Dracula so they did a makeup test with him and he ended up walking away from the project and so did the original director um, and so this makeup test does not exist anymore and the footage doesn't exist at least in 2013 it didn't and so that's that's the that's the piece of footage they're trying to find here but it would be very historic this book has a lot of film history in it, like like the other ones. Uh, there's a, another twist in this book that I really liked where Lauren D. Elsman does some short chapters from the point of view of Bela Lugosi over his life and, and it contrasts a lot between uh, Boris, Kar Boris Karloff's career and Bela Lugosi's career. And I think it's pretty well known that Bela Lugosi had a tougher time after Dracula than Boris had after Frankenstein. You know, he had, Lugosi had a real problem speaking English, and it kind of limited him. And and he had sort of, in his original original country in Transylvania and Hungary, in Transylvania he had been a leading man. He played Christ, and he played Hamlet, and he played uh, lead roles on the stage, and and of course he played. Dracula on the stage very famously and that was that was what brought him to the English speaking world and he was never able to really 
get along that well in English, and, and so he had a lot of uh, trouble getting cast. I mean, he, he played a lot of character parts and stuff, but he just didn't have the the great... He wasn't able to, I don't know, what you'd say, roll with it as well as as, as Boris Karloff did, so they had very different tra trajectories. So that plays a lot in, in the in the novel too. It's a very fun read, however, besides all that, it's fun to watch these, these curmudgeonly film nerds who are just like people you meet on Twitter. They hate everything that's new. They hate everything that's you know, there's the one guy the one character, uh, you know, can't even stand the hammer for films or he's hasn't seen any the last horror film he's ever seen is um was Exorcist and he vowed never to see another one after that and and you know he despises even the Hammer films because they're too bloody. It's it's kind of silly, but you know you can picture these people being on Twitter, uh, being very cranky today. Uh, I've noticed about film people in general that you know like very serious people who take themselves very seriously about film. There's really only two kind of films. There's the masterpieces that they like, and then everything else is garbage. So. You know, it's it's kind of set in that in that world. Um, I haven't got a lot more to say about Lauren D. Esselman's a great writer. He's written. I just looked him up on Goodreads, and he's written at least eighty books. He's probably most famous for his uh, what's the name of that character? Amos. Amos Walker. Uh, his his private eye. Uh, 1950s Private Eye series. He wrote a lot of westerns. Paige Murdoch is his main uh, U.S. Deputy Marshal kind of uh, western mysteries. And he wrote a lot of standalone mysteries too and a lot of standalone westerns. He wrote a great Sherlock Holmes pastiche, I think, called Sherlock Holmes vs. Dracula, which is the first book I ever read by him. And it's really good. He he's clearly really likes Dra um, Sherlock Holmes and Dracula too. I guess he's wrote another one, which isn't very good at all, called uh, uh, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Holmes, uh, which I didn't like at all. And he writes. He's very steeped in all kinds of lore. Like these these books show he's really passionate about Hollywood, and, and there's a lot of very interesting stuff in the in the back of these books these valentine books about the history of hollywood and he does a lot of research on them and you know he did that in a lot of his books because he does historical mysteries and westerns and stuff so they're always really well researched i was going to say something else about his research though oh his introduction to holmes versus dracula is very good to shows his passion for Holmes, he's also a fan of one of my favorite series of all time, which is which I should probably do at some point. I want to read reread them, but I have to wait till after my hundred book challenge because I don't own any of them. Um, Near a Wolf, which I think is probably my favorite mystery series of all time. And Lauren Estman has a short story series that he wrote that was collected in a book about this guy who lives in Brooklyn. Nero Wolf lives in New York City. He's got a, a you know, the stories are told by Archie Goodwin, who is his his aide-de-camp, I mean, his operative, his main guy who does all the legwork for Nero Wolf. And they live in a brownstone, and I think in the East 80s, East 80 blocks of, of New York City. Hope I don't have that wrong. The series runs a long, very a really long time from the 30s to the 70s, and then Lauren Esselman has a series of of books about a guy who's like a really diehard Nero Wolf fan in modern times, or whenever these stories were written in the 90s or whatever, who wants to wants to make himself into Nero Wolf, so he's a big overweight guy and he but he lives in Brooklyn he's trying to and he's trying to hire somebody who can be his Archie Goodwin and 
So he's trying to recreate the whole the whole thing and, and then solve mysteries. And they're very funny books because they usually uh, back. I mean, very funny stories. He usually backfires on them. But Alive, I would recommend. Uh, I want to keep finish reading the series. Uh, the first two books were Frames and Alone. The next book is called Shoot. And I'm guessing that's a Western. It's weird that. I'm just I'm I shouldn't get distracted by this, but I'm since I'm on Goodreads, which I hate, but I just I just got it up there so I could look at the name of his other series. I don't know about some of these descriptions of these books though. I wouldn't call Valentino a mild mannered film archivist. Maybe he is. But the next one is called Shoot, and I'm guessing from that title, because they're usually kind of puns on the genre uh, or, or the characters involved. Uh, oh, okay, interesting, interesting. Okay, so Shoot is going to be about... It's, I think it's a... Uh, an expansion on one of the sh short Valentino stories he wrote, which is, there's also a collection of, of, of short stories that he wrote about this character before he started writing, writing the novels. And the best short story by far in the collection is this one about the Roy Rogers Museum. He doesn't call him Roy Rogers. Uh, and I can see that the uh, the premise here of Shoot is about this, these same characters. Red Montana and Dixie Day is what he calls his Roy Rogers character. And pretty good story. It's pretty messed up. You can see why he couldn't use the real name Roy Rogers because he's, he's, he's pretty devilish. But I liked it because I remember going to the Roy Rogers Museum when I was a kid. My parents, my dad was really into Roy Rogers and um, I never really saw any of his movies or anything. But But they were out there and I enjoyed seeing Roy Rogers Museum where he has all his memorabilia and I think it's south of LA pretty far on the desert it seems like we're in famously has Roy Rogers horse trigger stuffed and mounted and his dog I forget the dog's name was also stuffed and mounted and and uh, just tons of memorabilia from his career I remember the most exciting thing to me was there was a picture of, of Roy Rogers and Vincent Price together because I was really into Vincent Price at the time so that'll be interesting I'll keep reading them there's only seven like I said and they're, they go pretty quick this book the one that I just read that I've been talking about alive had a reference to a really cool book I had when I was a kid that I didn't think anybody knew about or remembered except me and that is a book called, if I can find the title of it, which is such a goofy thing. People probably, younger people, I would have no idea why this would even exist. But I don't know if you can see there, but by Richard J. Annabeel or Nobile, James Wills Frankenstein, Universe Books, 1974. What this was was like a comic book version of the, not even a comic book, but a graphic representation of the screenplay where it's got this, you know, it's big trade paperback, it's got, you know, it's like 200 pages long or whatever, it's got still after still after still after still after still after still the movie of every shot of the movie with the dialogue underneath because at that time there was no other way, I mean, unless you owned a projector and, you know, and you were rich and you had like a Tarantino setup where you had your own 60 millimeter projector and stuff. You couldn't see these films when you wanted to see them. You had to wait till they were on cable or or get up on TV or something or some film society would show them or if you're lucky enough to big, live in a big town where they had revival theaters. And they and they had, the, there was a series of these and I had those Frankenstein books I could read it anytime I wanted and it's just scene after scene and it's got at that time which was the unedited version which shows the um, monster uh, throwing the young girl into the lake and a few other moments that were cut out that were had been cut out when the Hayes office came in when censorship came in in the 30s 
and then never put back in. Now they're back in, I believe. I, I think any version you see now is the is the uncut version of Frankenstein. So I'm a big monster kid. I was a big monster kid. I love horror stuff and and reading about these old movies. So if you're like that, you probably enjoy the series too. There's a lot of references to things that might go over people's heads if they're not interested in movies from the 30s. So I think it's written for people. Uh, old folks like me, I don't know how what the appeal would be for younger people unless they're really into movies. But I enjoy this series. I think I'll cut it there and I'll try and do more videos more frequently. I've been moving and I mean, getting ready to move. I, next week, I'm going to move to another another town here, and hope maybe I'll get some footage on the road or something, depending on which way I'm going to go, deciding between the bus or just taking some kind of car service where I can make a stop in, in some uh, heritage world heritage sites and, and see some of the actual uh, history of the country, which might be cool. I'll probably do that. Getting off track here. YouTube. BookTube, it's always a pleasure. Let's talk again.